Uh, can everyone see the slides here? Yes. All right, so what I built was a advanced GPS app for the Android mobile app platform. So I started out by planning it through learning the Java programming language to this class, and then also learning more about the Android operating system and its software development kit. So I also had to learn to use a build tool called Gradle for the system and also Markdown to publish it and also XML kind of like for the skeleton of the app. And then I had to learn to use a different ID called Android Studio to make the app itself. So in the process of building this app, I basically I split into different classes because I couldn't split, I couldn't run the entire app just from one large file. So I had to use object oriented programming to split it into different .java files and also XML files, as you can see here. So I also had to design it using XML, but that there's a problem because I didn't really have enough time to learn the whole length like, XML scripting link. I mean the whole like XML formatting language from top to bottom. So I just had to use their designer to drag the pieces on and then use the Java programming language to script the pieces, kind of like building a website. So the backend logic of my app included its Google Maps API, because as you can see here, it needs to use the maps feature in order to help locate someone and then also pinpoint them on a map. In addition, like I had to add the feature for users to drop pins so that they could save their location in what is a very, very messy CSV file here. I'm, this is a part that I struggled with and I had to figure out ways to like format the data so it's more readable. So in addition, it displays like certain messages under detected events like constantly pestering the user to enable location services. In addition, I also had to include its XML framework, which is kind of like its skeleton. And then also I had to deal with the problem of users enabling permissions for the app. So I also packaged the final product and put it on GitHub. So here's the link to the code. I'm gonna paste it in the chat if anyone's interested. So uh, here I'm gonna give a quick demonstration of how the app works. So as you can see here, I'm in Android Studio right now. Um, wait, let me get rid of this doc thing here. So I already started up its virtual device emulator, which basically simulates a whole Android device inside the code editor. So these are all each of the classes that I used. And this is the main activity part, which is the main file that gets run when I start up the app. So as you can see here, I had to attach like an ID to each of these UI elements, like the text views, the buttons, and the switches. So I had to give them an ID, then I, then I could perform various actions with them, like attach on click listeners, just like in JFrame and Swing. Then I also had to integrate something called the Google Maps API. This is my API key here. As you can see here, I also attach, I usually use multiple classes and object-oriented programming so that I could use the many features that were available in the available SDK. So this is the Maps activity part and I just had to use their API to create a map. So I'm gonna quickly run the app right now. And since I didn't connect it to locations yet because this is a native device, I'm just gonna directly go to the map. As you can see here, like the API key worked fine, just I haven't dropped any pins yet because if I hit this back button here, I can create new waypoints and also I can show a blank, oh, it crashed. Um, usually shows a blank list because I haven't added any waypoints yet. You can also adjust the location updates and toggle the GPS. So this was my project. So uh, thanks for listening to my presentation. Very nice. Great job, William. I see you did lots of work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. So here's a link and then I'm going to share my screen. So. Um, I coded a calculator thing, not for numbers, but for like tools. And so um, for things like checking if a number is prime, prime factorizing it, generating a number's factors, and then generating a factorial. So if like you're doing math homework or something, you want to quickly prime factorize a number, you can enter it here and then prime factorize it. So this is the home page, and then I just have tabs here. So we can prime factorize a number if they 12. It'll say two squared times three. We say 23. It'll say it is a prime number and it's just 23. I say like 144 or 1,444. 
2 squared times 19 squared. Next one is to generate factors. So if we have, say, 100, it'll generate all the factors of that number, 500, and it'll say how many fa total factors there are. Um, and the third one is factorial. So if we have, say, 5 factorial, it's 120. If we have 10, so if it's like generate factors, the button will be called generate factors. If it's prime factorized, the button will be called prime factorized. Just, just by customizing the type. And so this is the code to check if it's a prime number. Uh, this is to prime factorize it. This one was a longer one. This is to generate the number of factors in the number. And this is to factor uh, factorial. And uh, that's it. All right, great. Thank you. So uh, we made like this data visualizer right here. You have to use, oh, can I like type here? Probably like go there in like one second. Yeah. And if I try to, if I try to run it again, right here, uh, but like this time, we do 10 years, I guess. And then we do something like this. It just skips to the last one, the last data point, And then it goes from 90 to 100. Yeah, because in the loop here, apparently it just skips over like every single timer I make until the last loop and then it does this timer. Uh, hello everyone. Oh, that's the wrong program. Okay, so this is my Pong program. Mm -hmm. So, um, at first this is just a paint component. Uh, there's a timer I'm using to, uh, run every 30 milliseconds and that calls repaint every time. And there's three main functions, check paddles, check ball, and check scored, which all make sure that the game works properly. So if I run it, um, there's two players, but uh, one uses the up and down arrow, one uses W and S. And I added some momentum on the paddles so that they perform a little bit slippery. Um, the ball, every single time it gets hit by one of the paddles, it moves faster. So if I can get it to get fast enough, and then let's say let the ball score, you can see that it slows down when it starts again, and you can see that the score has increased. Another thing is that, um, I didn't, I did this in like a day, I didn't have enough time to fit all the bugs but this is also just a snake game I worked on during the uh, time for the projects um, there's a few issues with it but overall it works pretty well <laughs> this is a very short presentation I just made to explain pong in case like there were parents here and they didn't know what the game was <laughs> um, <laughs> I just threw like four slides together, uh, some difficulties I ran into as well. All right, great. Thank you. My code is just a very basic sim simulation of a double pendulum using the math and a differential <laughs> solver. Most of the time was just spent trying to understand the math behind it. So it just simulates it. That's what happens if you Set it very, set it exactly horizontal at the start. You can see it's pretty chaotic. Uh, if I change the values to something like um, 45 degrees, then you can, then you'll be able to see that it, event, it eventually follows a much different path than the previous. Although I can also change, I can also change the length of the rods, the mass, the gravity constant and the initial force. Uh, okay, I see a question from Caden. Can you make it start above 90 degree? Uh, sure. I'll make it start above 90 degrees. Just so math.pi, that's 180 degrees. Then 
It looks like that at the start. Oh. <laughs> You can basically put in any value though. Okay, that, that's the code. Okay, I accidentally sent it to TrueTM privately. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Um, let me share my screen. Can everybody see it? Yeah, we can see it. All right, so basically for my project, I did 2048, except instead of putting it in one file, I did, I did it through like object-oriented object programming which is why there's an unholy amount of files on the side here. So this is the block movement file. Um, this is basically where I put all of the code to move the block from like left to right, up and down, and through basically every coordinate and direction. Uh, there's also some uh, testing stuff here. This is block table. This is the um, where all the actual code is uh, for the logic of 2048. You see a bunch of stuff here. Over here is the block itself. What this does is it assigns the block a value and a X and the Y coordinate. And it also draws the block onto the J panel. Uh, this one is a tester. Uh, a driver for testing block. Uh, these two are also uh, testing whether these two work together. And this one is testing block movement. So this is what actually connects 2048 with the, it actually connects this to the person, which creates an interface as the main function it has a code and a cool switch statement. Uh, we have pink component functions and stuff, which I cannot be bothered with to explain. So we're gonna run this program. And I think you can see this. I accidentally pressed the button. What this does is uh, it basically is 2048. You can just run 2048. I'm not the best 2048 player, so we'll see uh, if I can get to, I think I set my program to end once you reach 512, but um, you, 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 we can just watch this or I can try to purposely lose. It's actually quite hard to lose 2048, but we'll see if we get to 512 or we lose first using this method. All right, so it appears that we have lost, so we cross a losing screen here. Now, if we go in here and change the winning number, from 512 to let's say eight. Um, basically, this makes it incredibly more easier to win. And hopefully we can see the winning screen as well. So yeah, this is 2048. Okay, that looks great. If I... I created a simulation of the double star experiment which is an important experiment in physics that demonstrates that light and matter can behave like waves as well as particles. It basically consists of a light source that illum illuminates a plate with two double slits, with two parallel slits, the, and the light passing through the slits can be observed on a screen behind the plate that would be around here. And if light was consisted classical particles, we would expect there to be a bright spot here and here behind, directly behind the slits and mostly dark spots everywhere else. But the wave nature of light causes the light to interfere and produce dark spots and light spots at much more different places than we expect. Here I visualize the relative intensities and of the light on the screen, and you can see where the light bands and the dark bands are. Down here, I visualize the wave of the light passing through the slits and interfering. I've also added a few modifiable parameters like brightness and the distance between the slits. The distance to the screen and the wavelength. As you can see, the graph also changes 
with, with changing the parameters. That's cool. Can, can you show us the code where you draw the graph? Yeah. Here are the variables. Here is in the main function, I created the frame and added everything to it. Here are the graphics, which is the waves. And here's the graph, which is this graph. Did the, you use any packages to draw the graph? Import any packages? No, I just drew rectangles oh, you just for the it. pixels and depending on a okay. formula, which I oh. used here. Okay, looks very nice. So that's the whole file. You put everything in one file, right? Yeah. Okay, that's like 400 lines of code. Close to 400. Very good. Good job. Good job, Ethan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Eva. Hello. <laughs> and we're going to be presenting a data visualizer. Eva. Uh, so as you guys might already know, I'm Eva and my partner is Maxwell. Hello. And our project is a data visualizer. So basically, data visualization is the graphical representation of information and data. We decided that the, the, the best way to take our goal, which was to develop a program that can make data, data into a visual, was to make a program that could turn sets of data into graphs, such as a line graph or a bar graph. Or... So this is the setup portion of our code, and it basically just creates the variables and defines the variables, such as the grid dimensions and the colors. It also bases its size, like the graph size, and its numbers off of the data set put into it. And in this portion of code, it generates a set of data to graph based on a maximum size of the data and a maximum number of data points. Then here is where it actually makes the graph and graphs the point. So how it works is at the top, it quickly makes the background by creating a white color, then drawing a big square slash rectangle. Then it quickly draws the lines followed by a size based on the largest numbers in the data set which we then use to add padding so that way it looked visually appealing so that way it didn't just go to the top of the data set. Then we called on grid colors which we and other colors which we set up in the setup portion and then we just drew lines from one point to the next. Then we plotted our data points using these functions one of which gave us the size and placed the dots which we will later connect because since it's just lines from place to place, there would be a gap. And the other returns the minimum, max, and the value of scores, which allowed us to calculate some stuff in other segments. So after running the program, this is the result. Are you going to show a demo or? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. I'm pulling it up right now. OK. Um, but while Maxwell is pulling it up, does anyone have any questions for us? So did you generate kind of like a random data set? The mm -hmm. one, the last graph you showed? Mm -hmm. Okay. That was just one of the random data sets. So here is our code. It is 180 lines long. And then when we run it, it creates the graph. Very good. I guess you can add a little bit of code and then you can create a bar chart, right? Mm -hmm. Or, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Great job, guys.